Amen. Thank you to those who have led us in worship. As we now draw our attention to the Word of God, would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the worship we have experienced. We've been able to lift our voices in song, in worship of you. Father, we now pray that we would turn an attentive ear to your word in worship of you. May your spirit guide us to truth. May your spirit convict us of sin and lead us to greater faithfulness to you. May this time in your word mold us and shape us into the image of your son, Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Samantha was a, an occasional church goer and one who struggled in life. She quit jobs on a regular basis. She often paid her bills late, and she struggled through seasons of depression. In conversations at church, she would express uh, her lack of strength and joy and hope. Faithful church members, would remind her of a time and again, time and time again, would would remind her of the life change which Jesus could bring. And Samantha often replied, I want that change, but I'll believe it when I see it. She struggled in life. It was told that Jesus could bring about change. And she said, I want that change, but I'll believe it when I see it. We are now in our fifth week in our Stained Glass Disciples series. It highlights lessons that modern day disciples can learn from these original disciples, the very first ones who accepted Jesus' invitation to come follow me. Our our guide through this series, our guide through our stained glass disciples is our very own stained glass rose window, which provides us images which depict the life story of these original followers. We're making our way around the rose window. We're discussing each disciple in the order which the window presents them to us. This morning, we discuss Thomas. He's depicted in our rose window with a carpenter's square and a spear. If your gaze is upon the window, it's easy to find Jesus at the center. Thomas's pedal is roughly at what I would say 7 o'clock. Thomas, depicted in our window by a carpenter's square and a spear. If you would join me in what is a famous Thomas passage... John chapter 20, we'll pick the story up in verse 24. John chapter 20, verse 24. If you're headed there, can I hear a big, loud amen? Amen. And the scripture reads, John chapter 20, verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, which your Bible might translate for you. It's a reference to 
the twin. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, also known as the twin, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. This is a after the resurrection. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he, but Thomas said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Verse 28, Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told them, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Amen. Thomas, when referred to in our New Testament, is given the nickname the twin. We see this in numerous references to Thomas. He's given the nickname the twin. But in pop culture and even among the pews, we give him the nickname Doubting Thomas. That nickname stems from the passage that we just read. After Easter morning, for whatever reason, this is a sermon for another day, Thomas is not with the group. And because he's not with the group, he misses the first resurrection appearance. He misses it. (laughs) He has to get secondhand information. Thomas, we've seen the Lord. He's alive. He's been raised. Thomas, because he missed the resurrection appearance, said something to the effect, I'll believe it when I see it. Is it fair Is it fair to paint Thomas as a doubter? I see why we do it. We know this passage. But but is it fair to paint Thomas as a doubter? If you read through the entirety of John's gospel, he'll give you three Thomas Stories. And in each story, Thomas plays a pivotal role. What can we, as modern day disciples, what can we learn from the life and ministry of Thomas? I've got a few things. For you, we, we will deviate from John chapter 20 for a moment, and pick up our other two Thomas stories, and then come back to John chapter 20. But what can we learn? What can we as modern day disciples learn from the life and ministry of Thomas? Well, first, uh, disciples stand, in strong, stand strong in the face of opposition. Disciples, stand strong in the face 
of opposition. I, I have the scripture reference on the screen and in the bulletin for you. Sometime this week, go read the story in its entirety. But it's in John 11 that Jesus receives the news that his beloved friend Lazarus is ill. I'm sure you're familiar with that story, but there's a Thomas role in this story. Jesus, at the beginning of John 11, finds out that Lazarus is ill. So Jesus then makes the decision that he's got to return to Bethany to go see Lazarus. But the disciples, <laughs> paraphrasing just a minute, a bit, says, wait, Jesus. Before we go back to Bethany, don't you remember what happened last time we were there? The disciples remind Jesus, the last time we were there, the Jews in Bethany tried to stone you. I'm paraphrasing, but this, this is in John chapter 11. Uh, Jesus, don't you remember they tried to kill us last time we were there? You don't want to go back there, do you? Jesus is undeterred. I, I'm going back to see my friend. Here's where we get a Thomas story. Thomas, in faithfulness to Jesus, says, let's go with him so that we might die as well. And that's straight out of John chapter 11. I, we, 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 we get distracted by... The, the, Lazarus and, and the stone being rolled away and Jesus bringing Lazarus back to life. But in John eleven sixteen, 16, Thomas, out of the mouth of Thomas comes the lines, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas. Thomas. The, the one we call the doubter. Thomas is willing to stand by Jesus' side, even with the threat of being stoned to death. Following Jesus does come with persecution. Jesus said, if, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. John 15, 19. And Jesus also said, Blessed are you when people insult you, uh, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. It's Matthew 5, 11. As modern day disciples. We face insult and perhaps persecution. But as modern day disciples, we are called to stand strong in the face of such opposition. Disciples stand strong in the face of opposition. Disciples also ask questions. In John chapter 14, Jesus prepared his disciple, all of his disciples, he, he, he prepares the twelve for his upcoming departure. This is yet another passage that we know really well, but we don't notice the Thomas portion of the story. John 14, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his upcoming departure, and, and he lets them know, I'm going away, but there will come a day when I come back, and I will bring you with me. And then Jesus added, you know the way to the place that I'm going. You, you know how to get there. You know where it is. You know the way. 
Enter Thomas. And Thomas candidly confesses that he does not know the location nor the route to this heavenly destination. <laughs> this isn't a paraphrase. This is just me inserting something into the story here. It's as if Thomas says, was I absent the day we talked about this? Right? Was I out uh, getting lunch? Uh, did, did I fall asleep during this lecture? I, uh, what he actually says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Thomas provides that question. And in response to Thomas's question, Jesus gives us the famous words of John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Think about that. It's Thomas's candid confession that he had no clue. It's Thomas's confession of his ignorance. It's Thomas's desire to know the truth that we get Jesus' response. It's through Thomas's question that we are reminded that salvation comes through Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. Disciples must be willing to acknowledge occasional ignorance and constant limited knowledge. We've got to admit that sometimes we are blatantly ignorant and we are consistently operating out of a limited understanding, a limited perspective. And with that confession, we seek godly wisdom. James Chapter 1, verse 5, delivers the beautiful promise that we can come to God seeking wisdom. And he provides it in abundance without finding fault. What a promise that, that we can come to God and say, I don't know. I've got no clue. I, I'm ignorant. I, I'm confused. I'm lost. And God promises that he'll provide abundant, provide wisdom, not, not just a little bit. He'll, he'll provide wisdom in abundance, and he doesn't hold it against us. He doesn't say, oh, you should have known, or oh, don't you know this by now? He graciously gives wisdom. The original followers of Jesus, as you walk through the Gospels, they, they were consistently taught and encouraged and many times corrected and rebuked as they went through life on this three-year apprenticeship sitting at the feet of Jesus. And over and over again, we see them coming to Jesus with questions and getting real Answers. Don't assume you know. Don't be fooled into thinking you have it all figured out. As modern day disciples, we must ask questions. Pulling us back to John 20 that we read moments ago. If you're still with me, can I hear an amen? amen. Uh, disciples move from doubt to deeper faith. In John chapter 20 that we read moments ago, Jesus has been crucified. And on the third day, uh, he has been raised from the dead. Sometime later... He makes a resurrection appearance. He, he appears to the disciples. 
But Thomas wasn't there. Thus, he doubted the reality of the resurrection. Thomas insisted, unless I see the nail-scarred hand, and unless I can put my finger into his side, I will not believe. It's with that statement, uh, Thomas's nickname as the doubter was sealed. Yet, if we if we read the story, if we're faithful to the gospel account. It's Thomas's plea to see the nail-scarred hands. His plea to put his finger in the side of the resurrected Jesus. It's because of Thomas's plea that we get the follow-up where Jesus says, put your finger here. Look. It's real. Stop doubting and believe. See, the, the life of a disciple is, is not having it all figured out. That's why we have to ask questions. And, and the life of a disciple is this constant life of growing, of seeking the Lord and finding Him of seeking the Lord and having our eyes opened even more, of seeking the Lord and seeing Him in His fullness yet again. If you read through the gospel accounts, this original group were frequently reprimanded for their lack of faith. In the church setting, we get scared by that. We don't want to admit our moments of lack of faith. But if you read through the gospel accounts over and over and over and over and over again, the disciples are displaying their lack of faith, their lack of trust, and they're reprimanded for it. Jesus says, ye have little faith. But with the reprimand, with them being right by his side, they see him yet again. And Jesus says, I, I see your lack of faith. Trust me as I do this. Jesus says, I, I see your lack of faith. Continue to walk with me as I do this. If we're actually reading the gospel account with each reprimand for lack of faith, these original followers have their eyes opened to Jesus just a bit more, and they step closer to him. Discipleship is about having our eyes opened. And stepping closer to Jesus. Discipleship is not about regression or stagnation. Discipleship is about growth. As modern day disciples, we're in a continual pattern of moving from doubt to deeper faith. Finally, disciples confess Jesus as Lord and God. Staying in John chapter 20, the verses that we read moments ago, it's doubt. 
that leads Thomas to make what I personally believe is the strongest declaration that we find in our New Testament. You've likely heard that from me before. This is my favorite. This is my go-to Easter passage. I firmly believe that the declaration that Thomas makes here is the strongest declaration that we see in our New Testament. And I love how this story unfolds. Thomas has, has already said, I'll believe it when I see it. A week later, I love that the, John gives us a week, right? So for a week... The 12 minus Thomas have seen the Lord. They, they, they have a firsthand experience with the resurrected Lord. For a week, Thomas is saying, I'll believe it when I see it. A week later, Jesus appears. He, he appears to the entire collected group of disciples. He greets them with a peace be with you. But then he puts a laser focus on Thomas. For me as a Bible reader, it's a display of grace. It's an amazing display of grace. He appears, a peace to all of you, and, and then he zeroes in on Thomas. He says, Here's, here, here are the hands. <laughs> Here's the side. Stop doubting and believe. And in response, John 20, 28, Thomas says, my Lord and my God. That's not just a, a, a clever way we, we render it in our English Bibles. There's a repetition there in the original text. My Lord and my God. It's an accurate declaration. After all, uh, Jesus has just been raised from the dead. It's an accurate declaration. The resurrection proved it. Yet the personal, possessive pronouns make it an, an intimate declaration. It's accurate, yes. The resurrection proved that Jesus was Lord and God. But this, my Lord and my God, for, for Thomas, makes it personal. When Thomas voiced this declaration, my Lord, and my God, when he voiced that, he, he did not voice a rehearsed or a reused phrase. He's, he's speaking as a man no longer with second-hand information of the risen Lord. He's now making the declaration of a man who has first-hand experience with the risen Lord. My Lord. My God. Thomas's declaration it needs to be our confession we need to, to make a, a confession about the identity of Jesus that is filled with personal, possessive language. It's my Lord, my God. And Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. On the, on the third day, Jesus rose from the 
dead, defeating sin and death. And it's in that completed and sufficient work that you have victory over sin and death. Yes, Jesus is the Savior of the world. And that's great news for the world. (laughs) Amen indeed, but what about me? He died for the sins of the world, yes. But he, he died for my sin. He provided me victory over sin and death. Jesus told Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's a word to me. That's a word to you as modern day disciples yes we preach from the mountaintops that Jesus is the savior of the world but before we get there modern day disciples make the confession that he's my Lord And my God. The stained glass rose window of the First Baptist Church of Sulphur Springs depicts Thomas with a carpenter's square and a spear. Thomas, after the events of the New Testament, travels to India. He preaches the gospel. He he creates communities of believers. And we are told that he builds churches by his own hand. Thus our window shows a carpenter's square. And while he's in... India preaching the gospel and building communities of believers and also building churches. Thomas has the opportunity to die in his faithfulness to his Lord. Tradition tells us that in India, while preaching the gospel, Thomas is martyred by way of a spear. Thus our window depicts Thomas with both a carpenter's square and a spear. As you gather in this place weekend and week out, as you sit in this sanctuary, I invite you to gaze At our window, I invite your gaze to fall upon Thomas's carpenter's square and spear and be reminded of your call to face opposition while confessing that Jesus is your Lord and your God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the invitation to follow after your son Jesus. And we are so thankful that Jesus provides us the way to eternal life. May we follow him now and live this life 
with abundant joy as we look forward to the day of eternal life. As we face difficulties, we pray for the strength and the courage to remain faithful to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We discuss